Welcome to Talking Beats with Daniel Lelchuk. We hope you'll subscribe and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Now, if you like the show, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash talking beats. We believe now more than ever in providing a platform for individuality, free thought, and a diverse range of views. By supporting the show this way, you'll get early access to episodes, bonus episodes, and much, much more. Remember, the conversation is always active at Talking Beats Podcast on social media. Here's Daniel Lelcha. On today's program, writer and professor Sherry Turkle is here. For decades, she's been chronicling the way we interact with computers, the way human emotions come into play as machines and computers play a larger and larger role in all of our lives. She's the author of the thought-provoking books Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other, The Second Self, Computers and the Human Spirit, Life on the Screen, Identity in the Age of the Internet, and Simulation and Its Discontents, as well as a book about the history of psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic politics, Jacques Lacan, and Freud's French Revolution. Sherry Turkle, who is the Abbey Rockefeller Mosé Professor of the Social Studies of Science and Technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is out with a new book, The Empathy Diaries. The word empathy, as you'll hear, runs through our conversation, runs through her thinking. What is it? Why is this word so elusive to so many people who try to reach out, who try to understand? Sherry Turkle is here to explain. I'm thrilled she is. Welcome. Delighted. You've been looking at humans and emotions and machines for quite a few decades, and here we are in the pandemic, a year into the pandemic. It hopefully will be winding down soon, but but the point is a lot of what's been happening in the past year with Zoom. Thank God we aren't on Zoom now, by the way, right? Yes. Uh, a lot of what's been happening ties in very intimately to what you have been doing for a few decades. What is happening now that you sort of saw happen over the long run since computers first came along when you were early on at MIT when Steve Jobs came over? Just give us some context. Some context. Well, I think that one of the interesting things that happen is that everyone had a fantasy come true. You know, people would say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so into, I'm so into my texting. I'm so into my screen. I'm so into my, you know, I, I love texting, not talking. This is the, you know, this is the way I can really be myself because I don't have to, I can compose myself. I can, I can find a truer self where I can compose my avatar and, you know, uh, talking face to face is so stressful. And this way I can sort of, you know, get more control. Well, now people in a way have, um, what's the word, have been able to uh, immerse themselves, sate themselves in this medium that they've been, uh, you know, and I've been this voice on the side saying, you know, be careful what you wish for, because certain kinds of capacities, certain kinds of human capacities, um, are undermined if you just do that. And then here we are, we've all had this opportunity because we've had to um, be on screens all the time. And I think we wish for the full embrace of the human. I think we've missed, uh, you know, we've, we've had, because we've had to do it, we've, we've risen to the occasion, but I think we've missed, uh, we've had a chance to value what we pined for, what we didn't know that we needed, which is that eye contact is so much um, that sensing the body of the person you're with gives so much information. And when you lose it, you really lose a lot. And that the mere fact of being in the room with your students and your co-workers, you know, it's, it's not just information. It's a sense of human connection and safety and trust, and that all of these things get um, eroded. And um, we're a little bit lost, I think, and very anxious 
as we um, go back to what the, the, the new normal, because we're not normal anymore. We've been sort of uh, taken out of the mix in a way that we would never have anticipated. So I think that, you know, I don't want to oversimplify, but I think that this pandemic has really, um, I, I don't want to be Pollyanna, but it's, it's made us a more mature consumer of the internet in, in ways that I tried to anticipate for people. And I, don't, I certainly would never say I'm glad it happened, but I think that I think we come back uh, chastened and not as uh, optimistic and not as uh, um, naive about um, what it is to live a life fully online. That's a long answer to a short question, but that is, that is how I see it, that we'll be better consumers now of this um, very powerful medium. You're talking about person-to-person interaction, and it doesn't have to just yeah. be in an extended setting. As an example, when all of this started, I uh, luckily we, we had a family property on a beautiful lake in New Hampshire, and I went there. It was completely isolated for a while, and I was thinking to myself, you know, at what point am I going to... <laughs> to forget how to interact with people in person. When is it going to happen? So I had been doing, you know, phone calls and FaceTime. Mm-hmm. This is before I was brought on board Zoom. I was an early Zoom resistor, so I was doing FaceTime and regular phone calls, which are wonderful, by the way. I think phone calls are, are far superior to a to a video call. Um, and in any case, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to the grocery store. So I went in and I... I said, am I going to remember how to talk to these people? So, <laughs> yeah. so by the by the time I left, I had the the cashiers were laughing and and I think they were yeah. smiling. The 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 man slicing the prosciutto was you know was right. charmed. The, the whole thing was great, and I left with a big smile on my face, thinking, okay, Dan, you still got it. You know? You've got it. You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, you know, that's a wonderful story because I what I've been interviewing people now about is trying to take the measure of their true anxieties as they uh, re-enter the, quote, world. And I think we have not yet taken the measure of how anxious people are and taken account of that as we talk about the new normal and about going back. Because in many ways, each of us has an area of vulnerability that being on our own and needing not to, quote, perform and needing not to sort of be social every day all the time, um, it's been a lightening of our load. But I think we're ashamed to admit that. I mean, you welcome the chance to interact again. And people, of course, welcome the chance to, to, to be social again. But there's also this other side of it that I think we need to mourn what we've lost, but also to um, acknowledge that parts of us are nervous about um, admitting to ourselves and to others that our, our load has been lightened in some way by being able to hide from the world. That we were living lives of too much, just too much. Um, Thoreau would say we live too thickly. I think this is going to be a difficult transition because even having that thought is disruptive. It's not the official line. The official line is we can't wait to go back. Don't you think there's some element of all this that someone would say, we have too much coming at us, we have too many Zoom events, we have too many lectures and concerts and every violinist in the world playing the Paganini, every <laughs> every yeah, you right. know every poet uh, reciting Shakespeare, <laughs> actor doing Shakespeare. I mean, is, 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 there's there's an over there's an over abundance of of options yes. online, but I guess that that sort of plays into what you were saying that maybe we're a little more discerning. Yes, and also you can turn it off. I mean, I, I, I let me be the first to step forward and admit I'll go to a reading and I'll be one of those people in the Zoom audience who has my name up there, but, you know, doesn't have my, you know, doesn't, or I'll start out with my picture up there and then I'll just have my name up there. On the, you know, on the, on the idea that I'm getting a cup of coffee or something. And then I'll just say, I don't want to hear this anymore. And, I, you know, <laughs> and on Zoom, you know, on Zoom, um, you know, I leave my name there. People are assuming that I 
didn't put on makeup or I'm, you know, drinking coffee or I'm sort of making <laughs> dinner for my family in the background and people aren't, you know, but really I'm, um, I'm um, reading a book and just don't want to be rude by, you know, signing out. But I, you know, that's what you can do online. That's why for years I've talked about um, how online life uh, degrades our attention to each other in ways that are not good for empathy because people never know if you're paying full attention to them. And that's, it's that feeling of full attention uh, that is so nurturant of empathy that is so helpful uh, for trust and empathy and uh, that allows people to be vulnerable, which is where empathy is born. And if you really think that, Oh, well, that, 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 that box that says Sherry Turkle, you know, she may not be listening and more than not listening, she may be writing her book. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That doesn't encourage trust. You know, you know, I think we've learned to modulate what we do online uh, and I worry about that in teaching when my students turn off the, you know, turn off their faces and just become little blank squares with their names on it. I assume I've lost them. I assume I've lost them. And you allow them to do that. Well, you know, things have evolved in my t- in my classes. I, you know, and when I first began, I thought my students were quite traumatized. Um, my students were traumatized. Well, we came to MIT on a Tuesday. I had brought food, as is my practice. I feed my students. And I had brought the worst kind of food. I brought things like, you know, making nachos together. I mean, I just was completely <laughs> out of it. I mean, I was like living on planet X. And um, I think my, my assistant said, Sherry, I, I, I think this may be the wrong kind of food. And I've been like on a trip to California where everybody was, you know, eating Indian food, which was also the wrong kind of food. We were sharing food. And I, I just, I took, I, anyway, I went into class, I spread out this food. Um, and I got a text on my phone that said, we're, you're, you're all leaving, you're all going home, pack up your books, you'll never see your, you know, we're closing down your office, take your last papers, if you need them, take your laptop home. And they had to leave sort of within 48 hours. They had to leave campus and go home. Trouble is, a lot of them didn't have homes. Um, a lot of them didn't have stable families to home to who had a room waiting for them. So they were then scrambling um, to figure out where to go. Um, should they rent an apartment for six in Cambridge and sleep three to a room? You know, I mean, I, it, I mean, they were they were really stuck. And they were traumatized students. I mean, for a college student, you know, where you, I've just written a, a memoir in those college years. You know, I, it, I've, I've reminded myself that, you know, those college years are a nest. They're a moment of being in a nest and, and just being thrown out on the street, uh, you know, by, you're going to be doing your, your, all your classes on a computer. And, and of course, I'm very, careful with my students. I see them. I, I make sure they come to office hours. We'll get, we'll get to that. That's another question. So, I mean, they were calling in to, to classes from closets because they were living six in an apartment and didn't have a space. Um, so I was very gentle with them. I allowed them anything. I said, look, you know, the, I'm, the, I'm, I was very stressed. I was very afraid. I was terribly afraid. You know, one moment I was like the queen of soul cycle and the next moment I was in an age group most likely to be intubated. You know, one mm. moment, you know, it was <laughs> like I crossed a line, you know, from being, you know, a, a young, vibrant me to having every to, to, to seeing myself as some person who was, you know, a potentially ill person. It was very traumatizing. So I would say that in the beginning, um, I said to them, look, we're in extraordinary times. We have to feel our way very lightly through this and be very gentle with each other and very empathic with each other. You know, and for me, empathy means uh, putting yourself not just in someone else's place, but really in their problem, really, and trying to walk that mile with them and trying to make a commitment to helping them in that problem. And that turned out to be, for me, the solutions I reached 
were a set of rules that were very different from when I began. I mean, to circle back to your question, that nobody could during the class. We had shorter classes, but nobody in the class could drop out. That this was our time together to be in a community, because I thought that that's what they needed to be in a community. And I mean, of course, if somebody needed a drink or a cup of tea or go to the bathroom, and it wasn't like a, it wasn't Nazi time, but I mean, it was the norm was that we were there to help support each other and be there for each other. And if you wanted to leave because something was wrong, you should tell us there's something wrong and can we help? Um, and then secondly, everybody should come, you know, with tea or toast or, you know, eating was allowed and people should be comfortable. Coffee and, allowed? Yeah, coffee. I mean, you know, I mean, really, you know, to make it a time of gathering. And then I put in another rule that office hours were to be by phone. Because people were very, that I would call them, we would have time alone, an hour alone on the telephone. Because I found that people were literally, you know, uh, doing classes from parks and playgrounds to get a Wi-Fi signal. They were in cars. Uh, People were living in very different kinds of situations. And um, uh, it was stressful for them to be dealing with those situations and other people seeing those situations. And we talked about those situations. It took the emphasis off them to be having to have these complicated feelings about really where they had landed up because college masks all of that, you know, everybody's in a dorm. So social class and inequality, uh, a college does everything to hide all of that. And a phone call they knew that they had my full attention for that hour, and that was helpful. Um, so I, I, during Zoom, I, I sculpted, I, I shaped um, styles of interaction with students that I thought would, would help them most uh, during the pandemic. I've always liked audio only, meaning a telephone call for mm-hmm. all intents and purposes. Yeah. We're, we're on a phone call now, just sort of a glorified technology, but but yeah. we're not looking at each other. And and I don't sit here thinking to myself, I, I wish I could see you. Not that I'm sure you don't look wonderful and everything like that, but, but I don't feel I'm missing out by mm-hmm. n- not having your face on the screen. And in fact, the opposite, I... I feel I'm able to go into a depth and Mm -hmm. into an emotional area that perhaps the image would distract from. Do you agree? Uh, I do. And here's why. Is because in order, we are wired when we're on a phone call to, excuse me, we are wired when we're face to face to get so much of our information and so much of our mutual mirroring that makes a face-to-face conversation work and makes us empathic to be looking at the eyes of the other person and picking up the slightest flicker, the slightest you know, change um, as part of our empathic connection. If we were on a Zoom call, in order to give you the illusion that you are looking in my eyes, that I'm looking in your eyes, both of us have to stare at that little red, at that little green dot on the top of our screen. In other words, both of us have to be looking at nothing, essentially seeing nothing during the entire call. So for me to feel, or just doing it from me to you, for you to feel that when I'm speaking, I'm looking in your eyes and giving you the signal of full attention, which is what people need to have that magic happen of, of feeling empathic connection, um, I essentially have to be looking at nothing and having no experience, authentic experience of empathy, because I'm just staring at this little green thing. And you, um, similarly, if you want to give me that full blast feeling, you have to be almost an avatar of yourself, you know, <laughs> looking at, so whereas in a, so, so we, you're shutting down the thing that makes it work. Whereas on a phone, we are wired to sort of almost close our eyes 
and listen for all of those signals, those subtle signals that come across in the voice. And we can. And it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And that's what gives you this sense of completeness. And I think that the decision to see my students during office hours was such a relief to them. And that feeling of being uh, given to, you know, really attended to, which is what you want from an office hour. Office hours with your professor shouldn't just be, you know, I'll give you information, you give me information. No, it's a, it's a mentorship. A mentorship is, you know, you may not have it right but I'll be there for you again, together again. Um, That's what makes a mentorship. And uh, in my, in my new book, I talk about so many times when I didn't have it right, but when my mentor said, come back, come back, you're good at this, come back and we'll get it right until I got it right. And how wonderful that was. And you can do that on the telephone because you really are giving them full attention. It's full attention that our devices have taken away from us, and it's full attention that we have to demand for ourselves and our children when we go back to our new normal. The lack of a visual stimulation is sort of how people like to go to a concert, go to a symphony, go hear me play Brahms Sonata and sit there with their eyes closed. And, yes. And there is something, I, I don't know if you're, if you're one of those people, we'll get to music because we always get to yeah. music here, but I don't know if you're one of those people who likes to listen to music with your eyes closed or sort of alternating. Some people like to alternate maybe two minutes with their eyes closed and they watch for five minutes or something, uh, but, but it's a totally different experience. I would argue even the sound changes, not just your emotional response, it actually sounds different when... Your eyes are closed. <laughs> Yesterday, we were doing a test of uh, a couple of modern violins uh, with my colleague, Mr. Silberger, and uh, comparing them with his Guadagnini, which is from the late 1750s, many million dollar instrument. And uh, so we were doing a blind test. And, and here I was sitting in the hall listening to him play uh, a brand new sort of $10,000 violin and then put up the old famous Italian millions of dollar violin and uh, it's amazing that that when my eyes were closed i literally heard things differently than when they were open that's amazing that's wonderful that's a wonderful story it's, it really makes the point but i i i i, I cannot stress you know it's it's it, it's such a great it's such a great story because it it reinforces my own experience that even before the pandemic uh my students would beg me to not have to come to office hours and to be able to just send me an email with the perfect question so I could send them the perfect answer. And, and I, would, I, 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 I finally just had to say, that is, not, that is not where the relationship that's going to make our relationship important for your life is going to happen with this fantasy of you're giving a perfect question and me giving a perfect answer. That's a that's an engineering fantasy of how this is going to go. You're going to give me a really half-baked idea because that's where the good ideas come from. And I'm going to say, that's a little promising but half-baked. Come again tomorrow. We can be together again, again together. And that is where our relationship is going to happen and that's where these ideas are going to grow in our society now in our culture now there is resistance to so many parts of the relationship i've just described number 1 there's there's resistance there's a fantasy that you don't need a relationship you can put in a, a computer who'll just give you answers instead of a relationship number 2 there's this fantasy that you just need the right answer. You don't need to go through all these steps. These steps are a waste of time. Why not just get to the right answer in this email in the first place? And then number three, um, there's this sense that all of that takes too much time. And then I'm kind of wasting their time, you know, with this these repetitive again, together, together agains. But I'm trying to teach them how relationships work and empathy works. 
so I can grow them up to be a full, I mean, I I see my teaching role as not just transmittal of knowledge packets. I'm, I'm trying to give to them what my mentors gave to me, which is a true love of learning and a way to think about what they're good at so they can be true lovers of learning. And, and in writing my memoir, there's been a, just a, a, such a realization that that really was what I was given in my education. Confidence that I could turn to myself and figure out, is this the right topic for me? Will this really, will this awaken in me the best in me? And you can't begin to answer that question if you've been going into every meeting with an advisor, you know, looking for a right answer. You're not not being prepared. So I try to get them over to my way of thinking, which I think is a deeply humane approach. Sherry Turkle, you've used the word a lot. Uh, The word is one of three words that make up the title of of your new book. It's not a very long title. The title is The Empathy Diaries, and the word I'm talking about is empathy. What is empathy, and what do most people misunderstand about the word? I even got into an argument with a friend this morning about it when I I said I was going to talk to you, and and this friend mentioned something over text of, well, empathy is a, a performative act. And I, I, it, I was offended by it. I, I reacted strongly. I found it a, a simplistic, silly thing to say to call it performative. And I said, I have never felt that at all. Uh, what is empathy? Well, you know, your friend, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic with your friend because I think everybody's talking about empathy now. Biden is the empathy president. We need empathy to get through, you know, to make friends with the Trumpers. We, I mean, everybody is, you know, empathy is what American politics needs. I mean, everybody is high on empathy, but I mean something much harder than what most people are talking about. And it, it's the opposite of performative. I'm saying that empathy is the, is the capacity to... Put yourself in someone else's place and then go beyond that to put yourself through an, through an act of active listening where you begin not with, oh, yeah, I, I kind of, yeah, I, I kind of understand that. You know, I, I was divorced. I know what a divorce is like, which is how most people, that's, most, that's, five in, that's five minutes into most people trying to be empathic. They sort of, you know, (laughs) identify and try to help. Mm -hmm. And my kind of, my definition of empathy is you go in with a kind of radical humility. You know, I'm here to listen because I don't know how you feel. So tell me how you feel. I'm here as me to listen to you and hear not only your, your, the place that you are at, but really to deeply understand your problem. And to help you best I can, uh, you know, it's your life, not mine, but to stay humble about it, not offer you, you know, life lessons from my experience, but to, you know, really walk with you as you search for your answer, Uh, not take over your life, but to stay humble, but to, you know, walk with you as you sort this out. It's a commitment to you. And it's a very active hum, enterprise. It's an enterprise with humility. Um, and it's a, it's a committed enterprise. And the reason that I think a lot of people have trouble doing it or even um, thinking about that humility part is that in order to be empathic, you have to have the capacity for relationship which begins in solitude. Empathy really begins in solitude and the ability to draw yourself into yourself and know who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, when you turn to other people, you 
you you can't really listen to them because you're almost looking to them to tell that to tell you who you are. We hate those people. We shun them, but we <laughs> but but it's so common in our society to not take the time and not have the capacity for solitude and always be distracted by our phones. We don't really know who we are. And so when we turn to other people, it's kind of like we're trying to figure out who we are by letting them tell us who we are. It's like, I want to have a feeling. I think I'll send a text. Um, and with this definition of empathy, which takes work, I really think that there's a lot less, people have a lot less interest in, you know, playing with their phones and a lot more to be gained by talking to each other and really, um, and really engaging with each other, but you certainly can't get by with performance. And I think that's the big misunderstanding. And that's why so many people say, oh, I'll use a computer psychotherapist. I'll use a computer um, uh, avatar to be a friend. It's because they don't understand that the performances that these artificial creatures can do is never going to get them to empathy. And it's sort of sad that so many people think that the best that they can get is a performance from people. Maybe that's why they're so willing to go to digital things, because they think that people are only going to get them performances. I think that's really very telling what your friend said. It's telling, and it and it bothered me. And I, I, I said, I, we're not going to come to a consensus, and I have to go anyway. We were texting. I said, I, I, I actually have to go do this shortly, so I, I'm not going to text any more about it. Uh, but it, it really it struck me, and it, it offended me. As, as someone who's had, since the age of probably five, since right around when I started cello, a disarming quality, an arresting quality in conversation with people much older and in very different stages in life that they open up to me in extreme ways. And I've had that I don't know, ability or, or whatever, impact or mm -hmm. influence ever since I was a little kid. And uh, I think that is related to empathy in a way. It's, it's, a, it's a, a way that people are, are put at ease that they suddenly want to share without even being asked. Yes, but I think that the quality that made that happen, I can just say from chatting with you for a very short time, is that you give off the vibe that you know who you are, and so you're available to listen. And that's the quality that allows people or invites conversation, invite, invites honest revelation, invites people to tell you who they are because they don't feel that you're casting about for somebody to tell you, that you, you who you are. And, it's, and sometimes very small children have that quality. But when adults have that quality, but, but, you know, leaving aside that there can be this kind of sense of containment with children, so this, this, there being kind of people who people confide in, probably not, probably not the best thing, but it's, it, <laughs> they can have that. They can have that from very young. Children can have that sense of containment from very young. And sometimes children who have a gift um, or who are very introspective, uh, people call them old souls. I mean, they, it's not good for them because they don't always have the, um, they have the aspect, but they don't have the, the, the life ability or emotional range to process what they hear. So it's never a good idea to use them that way, but it's the quality that makes that happen is the sense that you know who you are. So it's safe to talk to you because you're not looking for other people to give you the clue to who you are. That's the dynamic. And that's why uh, devices undermine empathy. That's the mechanism through which devices undermine empathy. It's not a question of just how much time we spend on them or, you know, screen time should be this many hours or that many hours. It's not really about that. It's about when we don't give ourselves attention. When, when, when we have a moment for reverie and instead we go to our phones, we don't discipline ourselves to look within and say, who, you know, who, who am I? Who am I when I have a moment of boredom? Who am I when I have a moment where I need to quietly just think about myself? 
who am I? And, and bypassing that is really bypassing a step that will give you enough of a sense of identity so that you can be an empathic person who other people will trust. I appreciate that explanation, that illumination so much. And, and as to what you just said about the moment of boredom or what do we do in that moment, everybody has been there, maybe even you, where you look at your phone yeah. and, 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 and there's, you know, there's not an email or a text you have to respond to right then, but you think, well, well maybe I'll, I'll check the headlines. Maybe I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll read an article instead. If, if I'm not going to write a text right now, l- let me read that article and that other tab I had pulled up. You know, and and suddenly, or there's a movie, or there's a movie, <laughs> and then suddenly, uh, you know, an hour and a half later, you you realize that you actually have been on the screen for another hour and a half. Um, but mm-hmm. l- let me just go back to something you said before, because you you yeah you, you said one of my favorite I, uh, terms. It's sort of a term, active listening, and mm-hmm. it, it's a term that I use a lot in music when I give a master class, or even when people ask me how to how to talk to people I, I i say it's not just about listening it's about active listening and active listening certainly in music and i think conversation too means you have to respond you have to react it's not not just about well i i mm-hmm. i heard the way you played that phrase in the schubert sonata uh and it was nice it's no i heard it and i'm going to modulate what i'm doing immediately in the moment to fit with it otherwise you've missed a chance it has to be an instant reaction that's what active mm-hmm. listening requires. It requires you to react in the moment and to modulate. That's why so many interviews are so bad, because obviously the person asking the questions is looking at a list of questions. Uh, and it's so obvious <laughs> when the conversation sort of is jumpy and it goes from one topic to another sort of awkwardly because you, you feel the person not really listening they're just looking down and going through a checklist, and it's awkward and mm-hmm. jumpy. Yeah, and the the reason, um, the reason, and again, you know, I'm no luddite. I mean, if you were here, you would you would laugh because you know I have so many computers and phones and different kinds of earplugs and different <laughs> kinds of and different kinds of headsets. And I mean, I I, I look. I mean, I really do look like I. I mean, I. Definitely not a lot. What are we using right but now, Sherry Turkle? Right yeah. now, right, right now, I have. Well, I have a, I have a uh, phone. I have a phone because many of the people who I have interviewed me wanted me to do an external recording of the conversation. I have a, I have a very special computer that's an that's a that I bought up. I don't, I don't know if I want to give it a plug, but I bought it up because it was the last. Uh, Apple that um, was small, but was a full computer. Now they make them only 13 inches. And I have the last 11 inch full, full, full size computers that they made at 11 inches. And I have a live, I have a, a stack of them and that, you know, one by one, they, <laughs> they frizzle out <laughs> because they're, they're from 2011, but I, I can only use, I'm, I'm only willing to use these. Um, but I mean, I have a very large, <laughs> you know, a very large, um, a very large stack of technology. Um, but um, the the thing about active listening is that you you can't do it if you lose the habit. And you lose the habit. I mean, you, you it requires practice. Well, I want to just let me just get to the to the to get to the chase. I mean, you you it's not something that just it it's a some people have it as a gift, but it's a gift that can get rusty. And for, and but everybody can develop it, but that takes wanting to, and it can have its awkward moments because you know when when you're in a when you're in an engaged conversation of active listening, there's also somebody who's actively putting out, who's expecting something from you, and it's a high risk conversation. Because if you're actively listening and I am increasingly opening up to you, I'm increasingly making myself more vulnerable. And as I raise the stakes of greater vulnerability, you have to be more and more attentive. So it's very important to stress this part of active listening, that it evokes more and more truth telling on the part of the other guy. You see what I'm saying? 
It's not like yeah. you just get more and more into a state of grace. <laughs> I get more and more into a state of vulnerability, potentially. So that if you all of a sudden say, okay, that was great. I actually wasn't paying attention the last, you know, you know kind <laughs> of like I sort of missed the last 15 minutes, but we'll pick this up again. I'm like, I'm just, I'm, I'm bereft. And if I'm a vulnerable person, I can be really bereft. So if I'm, if I'm having office hours with students and I'm saying I'm giving them, I'm giving you, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I'm very careful to not be a psychotherapist when I'm a professor. You know, the, it's, it's a very important line to maintain. Because you can do both, if I right? Say to, yeah, I can do both. But I mean, I, I know when I'm doing one and I know when I'm doing another. But if you say to a student, I'm going to be on the phone with you for an hour and it's your time. I'm, it's, it's just your time. So let's talk. That student is going to talk. And if I, that's a big responsibility on me, as opposed to if I just kind of march into it, you know, if I just kind of, you know, get them on Zoom and look at the other way and say, hey, so what, what's your best idea for the paper? And they come up with something pre-canned. I say, well, that sounds pretty good. You know, uh, here's some reading stuff. Uh, ciao. <laughs> Nothing is at stake. Their emotion, you know, they've they've pre-wired it. I've looked had a chance to look at it in advance because they've sent it in advance. Um, nobody's going to be hurt, and nobody will have. No one will be vulnerable. And I think that really, it's that you, you, I always go back because I think that if we don't talk about what it's really about, we're not going to be talking about anything at all. What computers, what what the digital, not just computers, what the digital, what digital devices do is it gives us the fantasy that we can be human beings with less vulnerability. That's what talking to a computer psychotherapist is. That's what talking to a computer coach is. That's what having a computer companion is. You can somehow get through this life with less vulnerability. And that's the question of the pandemic is... Some of us have come to realize that, you know, being hidden away in our hidden, you know, hidden away each in our rooms with less vulnerability has not felt good, has not felt good. And we've missed something that has to do with human vulnerability, which has to do with the essence of being human. And let's talk about that. The essence of being human is encapsulated in great music it's encapsulated in a symphony of beethoven or an opera of verdi uh, or a uh, a serenade of tommy dorsey and frank sinatra uh sherry turkle what, what role does music play in your life i know for a lot of people the past year has shown them they need music more than ever i've i've been saying to a lot of people that music in the time of the pandemic has been sort of the one thing people can fall back on, a place of, of solidity, a place of, of reliability. You, you know it'll be there for you, and there's nothing artificial about it. What is music for you? Has it helped you? It has helped me, but it's, it's very interesting. Um, I grew up in a home with no music, uh, except um, the great um the great american songbook of uh the classics of the american musical theater really from 1918 to you know through the 50s and early 60s that's the best period and uh i, I well i mean i grew up with it all my aunt i i my, my mother was divorced we went back to a um one bedroom apartment that we shared with my uh grandparents, my mother's parents and her sister who wasn't married. And my mother slept on a fold out couch with her sister and I slept on a cot between my grandparents. And we, we had very little p material possessions, but my aunt had, we had a record collection of the great cantors singing the classics the great Jewish cantors, Jan Pierce, I'm thinking was my grandfather's favorite, singing, singing um, the classics of Jewish liturgy, literally as though they were rock stars. So Jan Pierce singing Kol Nidra 
was like um it took a long time for my for me to realize that this was sacred liturgical music because this was like played like like as one of the greatest hits sure <laughs> these were well, he was, was an opera singer, was, Jan Pierce. So he, yes, he yes. So I mean, this operatic was, quality was, to to a exactly, sacred music. So exactly. So we. I mean, I, I I have to laugh that I I I thought when I actually found my way into um, um, into synagogues where um, people were praying, you know, and and I you know I used to spend. I loved my grandfather. My greatest pleasure was sitting on his lap and having my head in his chest as we listened together to Jan Pierce. I mean, these are my most precious childhood memories of of being loved and of being part of this tradition. You know, going to temple and hearing, you know, mumbles, mumblesy mumbles. (laughs) (laughs) Sort of. (laughs) So... But everybody was singing. Everybody was singing Oklahoma, and and, and everybody was singing My Fair Lady, and everybody was singing, uh, you know, Annie, get your gun. And uh, so um, I found myself uh, during the pandemic, um, first of all, uh, having a sort of steady date with Yo Yo Ma, uh, who uh, played what he called songs of silence, uh, songs of so- um, solace from his kitchen um, or it looked like he was playing it from his kitchen or his hallway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And sure. That, that he, sort of corner there. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> some kind of corner yeah. in his house. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I, what I loved about it. So I did that and, and listened to, and, and actually listened to um, uh, chamber music. But I also went back and listened to the songs of my childhood um and and i was writing my memoir at the time during the pandemic so it sort of really helped me reimagine brooklyn because really i would come back from playing and um they were they, either my mother would be playing the blue tango and dancing in the living room with ben, or you know the dorsey brothers she imagined herself in a glamour in a glamorous life dancing to uh the big bands and those records were there or, and she would be teaching me the tango and teaching me the foxtrot to get me ready for the life dancing to the big bands that she imagined for both herself and me. And then listening to, um, then listening to the soundtracks of the music I grew up with. So between Yo-Yo Ma and chamber music and, 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 and dancing around to, um, and dancing around to the big band, I have had a very, both a very dancey and a very uh, American musical stage uh, pandemic. But it involved a lot of dancing. I cheered myself up by dancing and singing and putting on uh, big musical com and big big musical numbers. And uh, but also, I was very. I should say, I was very moved, and I think a lot of people were by this notion of these performances of music that were not performances they were also solitary meditations because i've also I've, I've always felt that when you watch a great performer uh you are watching something that is both performance and meditation I know that could be something the performer is, you know, um, giving you the illusion of, but that has been my experience of the performance of great music always, because that really is what a writer is doing. I mean, a writer is creating when I'm, when I'm, or let me just say in in speaking, when I give a, a good speech, if it's a good speech, it's because I'm giving content that I've worked over and I know it and it's in the perfect order and it's very clean. But also I'm thinking while I'm doing it. It's not just packaged. You know, I know it so well that it also is me thinking. Like now I'm, I'm actually thinking. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not reading something. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to 
make this connection. I, I hadn't thought about it before. The reason I think that the Yo-Yo Ma and also the Patrick Stewart reading Shakespeare was another non-musical example of a great artist reading reading the Shakespeare sonnets from his uh, porch um, was that when he came to a sonnet that he didn't like, he said, I'm skipping this one. I don't like the way it treats women. And in a performance, he might not have done that. This was him thinking, I, you know, I, I'm here as me, the person too. I need to relate to my audience in a certain way. I'm going to throw off a certain kind of avatar of performance and share that I want to, this is for me. This is my healing too. I don't want to read something that, that's going to upset me. During the pandemic, these performances engaged me in a way of thinking about my own creativity where it, of course, was for my ultimate reader, but it really was for me too. And I think it was that that experience was very helpful and healing. And I don't think it would have happened just by kind of going to the theater. You know, I mean, I think it, it, it I owe that to to the pandemic. Singing and dancing and uh, behaving with no abandon and having music be the catalyst for all that. I, I, I think it's terrific. And I think a lot of people will be able to relate uh, the, there's nothing nothing quite like it the the joy and the sadness everything in between of being alone and mm -hmm. and uh being able to uh, experience both the past and the present and maybe the future at the same time via music it's amazing what it can do well yeah because you know i taught my daughters all these songs you know i mean i took care you know i didn't have a very uh in, in in terms of what I was going to pass on from my childhood, I didn't. All these all the people who raised me were dead, and I was determined that she would know the words and music and story and book to Gigi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, something. You know, My Fair Lady, Sound of Music, uh, uh, Brigadoon. Carousel. I mean, you know, there was some. Yeah, Brigadoon. I mean, some things, Cinderella, the, the Rodgers and Hammerstein version. I mean, there were some things that were, you know, not going to die. Uh, so, uh, yes, music is, you know, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. But yes, I've been dancing and singing my way. I've been dancing and singing my way out of, uh, out of any, any depression that comes along. Well, Keep doing it. Um, it look, uh, it's it's a good self <laughs> self self therapy, self help, and and you don't need to go out and, and buy a, a kitschy book uh, either. It's the best kind of self or a robot or a robot or, 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 or. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sherry Turkle. As we come into a new normal, which is going to be happening the next maybe three, six months, certainly a year, where a new normal is going to emerge. And it's not going to be exactly how it was before. A lot of things are going to be different. But the overarching theme of a lot of your work has been the relationship between emotions, between humans and technology and computers and all of that melding together. Uh, are we going to be in a better or worse place as we come out? out of this are, are you are you pessimistic are you optimistic do you think it's is it damaged us irreparably as a society what what do you see what do you predict well i think you know i i studied with victor turner and, and a great a great anthropologist in, in the, at the university of chicago as part of my graduate education and he had a concept of liminality but at times betwixt and between which is what we've had, and take away the fancy, take away the fancy word, and what a betwixt and between time does for you, is that it um, old rules are gone, new rules haven't been born, and you have choices that you didn't see as choices anymore. New combinations can happen. Uh, you know, when last time America had something like this was in the '60s, uh, we didn't make radical political changes so much as uh, 
rules about sexuality changed, rules about how teenagers looked, rules about uh, race relations, who you could bring home to your mother. I mean, we forget how segregated childhood was. Uh, we forget, uh, you know, how uh, not just between black and white, but between the siloing of religious groups and where friend where friendships were made. And, uh, you know, I went to a Harvard where, for example, where my friends were the Jewish kids from public high schools who'd gotten scholarships to Harvard. And that wasn't because I was like so shy and didn't want to meet anybody, but I, I was never invited I wasn't allowed in the clubs where the other people were. I mean, I wasn't like, Mm. I wasn't like trying to be special. My point is, is that things can really change during these times of betwixt and between. And I think to say the thing I'm most positive about is that in the area of technology, I was doing a study before the pandemic where, uh, where education companies were trying to sell people on, we have a program and it will track your your child's learning and it will measure every keystroke it'll measure when he or she uh, is bored it'll it'll uh, present content you know that's exactly right for him or her um you know basically uh, i don't want to say a a cradle to grave but a cradle to college uh uh, learning environment, uh, you know, you get the best teachers, we'll have Sherry Turk on tape for you, you know, everybody perfect. If you tried to sell that to a, a parent now, I think the parent would say, could you please give my child a person? My child needs a person to talk to, a mentor. My child does not need a screen. Enough, enough with the screens. And I think that the oversell of your education on a screen, you know, denuding uh, education of the people and putting in the screens, I think that people have had a wake-up call of how much education is really about the people you meet along the way. And so much of the Empathy Diaries is about the power of the people I met along the way. I've had so much time to reflect on the importance of that mentoring. And I think now the pandemic has given everybody that time to say, you know, these screens are great, but we need people. We need people to have the education that children need. And that is one of the places where I am most optimistic we're, we're going to be much less uh, smitten by those kinds of ideas. And we're going to value more, you know, what I'm calling the full embrace of the human. The full embrace of the human. I hope we get there. I hope we <laughs> aren't at dinner and 15 minutes in say, I, I have to take this call. I have to glance at my phone, but don't worry. It's just 10 seconds, a quick glance. It's just 10 seconds. Then I'll put it down. And and then the other person uh, either, as you've talked about, either (laughs) sort of looks around (laughs) and feels the secondary or or as a sort of defense mechanism, they pick up their phone too. And then the people are just both staring at their phones, which I guess is better Mm -hmm. than one, uh, right? (laughs) This whole, this this, this scene is so dystopian and so widespread. I mean, it's where we are. But I'm trying to say, now I think we've had an experience where maybe we won't do that so quickly anymore. We've had a lot of screen time. We've had a lot of screen time. And now we need the person. And now we know we need the person. We, we it's not just that we it's not just we need the person. It's we know we need the person. Sherry Turkle, the new book, The Empathy Diaries, and many wonderful things in here to look at and uh, discuss and and I do appreciate uh, this conversation it's just been a real pleasure well for me too you've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk the original theme music is by Ronald Barkham the content coordinator is Nathaniel Mose and Doug Christian is executive producer we invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. 
You can support us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash talking beats. And be sure to check us out on social media. We'll see you next time on Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk.